Good morning, Eagles. How are you today? Excellent. Would you pray with me? Our God, I thank you so much that uh, you love us. And I ask, Lord, that what is said this morning is not uh, finely crafted language, but words of sincerity and especially uh, words of power as it comes from your word. I pray also, Lord, that you would prepare the hearts, the ears, the minds that receive it and hear it. And I ask, Father, that you would continue uh, to carry that with us throughout this day. We have a lot to be thankful for. And I thank you and praise you uh, that we have the mind to do it and the hearts to feel it and the opportunity to show it. In Jesus' name, amen. Some of the greatest minds, the philosophical and psychological minds of human history have uh, determined that when human beings make decisions, we rarely make decisions for the sole purpose of being miserable. We usually make decisions because we genuinely think that the decisions that we make are going to be good for us. And they're going to probably align pieces of information with circumstances and that we're going to look at those things and we're going to say, okay, I'm going to decide on this because it's actually good for me. But what if you did do that? What if you actually sat down and decided, okay, I'm going to make a plan to be miserable. So I looked it up. Somebody actually did. Here are five steps to live a miserable life. Number one, isolate yourself. Repel all those who have invaded your life with obnoxious qualities such as caring, affection, and friendship. Take Number two, take all things seriously. Complain about everything. At no time allow yourself the frivolous opportunity to be amused or spend time with inferior, inadequate, stupid, and unpleasant people who may actually amuse you. The third step to live a miserable life. Adopt, quote, only the past and the future matter. Gripe about the past at all times. Blaming all those who have caused your life or cursed your life and do nothing to consider the future. Worry, un worry unceasingly about all things that are coming, especially those things that ha you have no control over. Number four, become utterly directionless. Do not commit or believe anything regarding you, your friends, your social life, about school, beliefs, relationships, and most of all, how to be respected in society. Vigorously pursue, not yet. And finally, the final step to living a miserable life. Perfect the art of self-inflicted paralyzing fear in your life. Absolutely refuse to advance any sense of normalcy, usefulness in your life. Deny all forms of value and meaning in your everyday functions. Obey all impulses, especially those that are inherently selfish. Now these are five steps to live a miserable life. And I'm hoping you saw them as absolutely, totally absurd. That nobody would do that. Nobody would do that. Because we tend to value who we are. We value, we value the fact that we have relationships in our lives. We value the fact that we are created beings. We find it in Scripture. We're created to do good works. Now, one of the things that I noticed in the midst of this is the one of the things that tells you to extract out of that is relationships and the value of relationships. And I don't think we can function as healthy human beings without relationships. In fact, the, I think that one of the most powerful things in all of the universe is relationship. The thing that God has created that gives us the most value, that gives us the most 
power as a human being to make decisions to increase and make life better is that in relationships and not just human relationships but in other things so it kind of get to the point where he asked the question if i was going to make decisions about my life then how do i want to live and i would ask for us how do you want to live as well so when i think of relationships one of the things that i've been paying attention to quite a bit is a relationship that jesus had with his disciples and i've been trying to think okay how powerful was that what if i were to project myself into being one of his disciples knowing what scripture tells us and and tells us of that relationship those relationships how would i have reacted so i looked at one particular passage in john 14 6 it says 6 through 8 but i want to really focus on 6 and 7 it says this jesus said to him i am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me if you had known me you would have known my father also from now on you do know him and have seen him now when i look at that i i recognize that this is one of the most quoted passages of scripture and I have quoted it myself a lot of times. And on this end of history, it's pretty easy to explain what Jesus is talking about here because he is the way. And when on this end of history, I know what he did at the, on the cross. I know that he died for my sins. I have no control over uh, dealing with my sins. I only get to receive that through what Jesus did on the cross. And that is the truth. And that I have life in his name on this end of history. But if I were one of his disciples sitting there listening to him say this, would I hear it exactly the same? So we're going to look at this passage in this verse. And I want to submit to you, there's a lot of ways of doing this, but I'll offer to you three things. We're going to look at it three ways. Observation, interpretation, application and i'm trusting this is familiar to many of you so first observation we're going to look at this passage and we can't help but just look at these words in six and seven without looking at the context so context is king so we can really understand where the meat and potatoes of this is when we understand the context so where is jesus where are the disciples when he's when he's talking about this and uttering these words this is in the section of the book of john that's called the farewell discourse it literally is thursday moving into friday the celebration of the passover in the last hours of jesus's life they have sat down to supper they're sharing a meal together and the disciples are all there and they're having a conversation and Jesus says to them, he says, I'm going away and I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And you, you know where I'm going and I'm going to prepare that place for you. One of them says, well, how do we know, how do we know that place? And then Jesus says, he, the, the disciple says, how do we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And in this conversation, if I were sitting there with the disciples, I would have to be reminded, I'm sitting in the presence of my rabbi, who I have spent the last three years of my life with. This rabbi has taught me the law. He's taught me how to live the law, given examples of, the fulfilling, of fulfilling the law, and I have watched him numerous times do incredibly miraculous things. And just recently, we went to a town where a family was mourning the death of one of Jesus' closest friends, and Jesus raises him from the dead, coming out of the grave, stinky and smelly, truly dead. And I was there 
and I watched it if I were one of his disciples. I also heard him say on more than one occasion the term I am. And knowing the law being, being taught by my rabbi, I would have known the reference to that term I am. It goes all the way back to Moses standing before a burning bush. When Moses questions after God says, I'm going to send you back to Israel to release my people that are in captivity. I'm sending you back there and you're going to convince Pharaoh. I'm going to convince Pharaoh through you to release them. And Moses goes, well, who do I say sends me? And he says, I am sends you. Earlier in the book of John, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is connecting himself to the Father. And, it's, and even in these two verses, he says, he says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I'm hearing these words if I was sitting there as one of his students, and it hits powerfully. I can't help but think that there are some in the room who are still not necessarily completely and totally on board. Wait a minute, you said you're leaving. You're going to prepare a place for us. Where are you going? And I'm pretty sure they were thinking maybe geographically. Was he just like leaving the land? You and I know on this end of history, these are the last moments of his life. He literally, this is Good Friday that started at sundown. And after sundown, they had this Passover meal. And it literally is Good Friday. And in a few moments, maybe hours or minutes, they're going to get up out of this, what we know now as the upper room, and they're going to walk out, and they're going to go to a place where Jesus is going to pray, and the betrayer is going to lead the people to arrest Jesus. And they may not know this yet. So when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, these are powerful, powerful words. So that's observation and the context. Interpretation. So when we understand what those words mean and the fact that it draws Jesus directly to the fact that he is God. John in this book says that Jesus is God in the flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And later on in verse 14 in that same chapter he says, and the word became flesh. That's what John writes. Did the apostles know that then? Did those disciples in that room know that Jesus was God in the flesh? Or were they just knowing that he was directly the way to him? Now, as a good Old Testament student, I would have heard those terms, the way, and these images may have popped into my mind. For those of you who are familiar with studying the tabernacle, when you went into the presence of God, that only happened one time a year, and it was the high priest, and the only way that he could is when a sacrifice was made, blood was shed, and the blood was carried to that veil, and that one time a year, they went through the way into the presence of God, and the reference may be that veil. If you're a good Old Testament student, you would know then that the way is, a, is an Old Testament reference that directly talks specifically about walking a righteous life in accordance with the law. And as an Old Testament student sitting there as a disciple, then you would maybe evaluating, have I lived this life according to the law? Is that, the law, is that what Jesus is talking about? And when he talks about the truth, then the truth is the fulfillment of that law in the lifestyle that you chose because you've lived by the law, the way, the truth. And then the connection is the reward for the way and living according to the law is the life. It's that reward for the life, which is dependent upon, again, in the Old Testament, the sacrifice of an animal and the shedding of its blood and it being presented before God so that those sins may be forgiven. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And then finally, application. What are the disciples they're looking at? How are they looking at this? How do they see this? And the application has to rest in the relationship they have with Jesus. Is he talking about this to me? Is he talking about this to us? Is it a bigger audience? How are they to recognize, how are they to live out that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Sitting there in that room at that time, at that night, at that place, do they realize what's about to happen? Or are they focusing on the relationship? Regardless of what is about to happen, the most important thing that's going on in that room right now for them is they're sitting in the presence of their rabbi. They're sitting in the presence of God Almighty in the flesh. And they are about to, they, on this end of history, we look at that and they're about to experience something that no other group of people have ever experienced. And that's a really significant thing. It's a significant thing to observe. And so what I want to do is, is to ask the question, okay, what if I was to take those three principles, observation, interpretation, application, and apply it to my life, and you apply it to your life? You think about the fact that you sit in Bible class multiple times a week, chapel twice a week. You hear people come up and they present to you a gospel that is powerful and life-changing. Every one of you hears that message differently, and even every one of you, even as I speak, you're hearing this message differently because each one of you comes from a different position. Every one of you has a different life experience, a different context in your life that you will hear the gospel differently. And your response in your mind and in your heart, that words that you hear resonate different for every single one of you. And yet, the same gospel is for every single one of you. And me too. And the simple fact is, that if we were to observe where we are in our life and the fact that, that Jesus went to the cross for us, did he do it so that my sins are forgiven in the context of my life? Is it the same as the person next to me or is it different? And then what does that truly mean for me? What does that truly mean that Jesus went to the cross for me? Is it, is it that, okay, my sins are forgiven and my life is going to be better? Or is it my sins forgiven and my eternity is determined? Is it my sins, are my sins forgiven and that blood was shed and now I get to enter into the presence of God and literally, it is from that moment on and for eternity. How do I view that? How do you view that? And then how do you wrestle with that in the context of your life? Do you realize, do you realize that that information, the gospel, the shedding of Jesus' blood, dying for your sins, giving you the opportunity to respond to that, do you realize that it can change the course of your life. And clearly, the scriptures are very, very specific that he has created us to do good work and he has created us with a plan in mind. And I'm trusting that when you hear that message, when you hear that gospel, that you observe where you are, you figure out the meaning for you, and then the application is that you decide for you. You decide. Where does it fit in your life? And you ask the question, how do you want to live? 
if you make a, if you make a decision to respond to the gospel, I guarantee you there's going to be a couple of things that are going to happen. One is every time you read the word from that point on, there will be things in there will speak directly to the core of your life. When you ask the question, how am I going to live my life having made that decision, some of those passages will take on a brand new meaning for you. You will be referencing things out of the blue because your mind and your heart will be sensitive to them. You're going to deal with things differently because the word is going to become alive in those, sent in those situations. And it may be that in the midst of that, you discover a, a brand new way at looking at your relationships, but most importantly, the relationship that you have with Jesus. And that Jesus, he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and you will connect with the Father in ways that you could have never imagined before. Now, this happened for me when I was 18 years old. And I'm positive that most people will say life didn't all of a sudden become fantastic. Because it didn't. It was, it was painful for a while. It wasn't painful because of Jesus. It was painful because of me. Because I kept getting in the way. And I kept getting... Uh, I kept convincing myself that the change, that I was still struggling with my sinful nature. And then I started to really focus on the idea that it wasn't I having to change my behavior. It was I having to change my perspective. That I had to focus on that relationship, the relationship with Jesus, God in the flesh. I had to focus on treating Jesus as though he was the most important person in my life. And I had to recognize I was no longer the most important person in my life. And when I asked the question, how am I going to live my life? Then the answer wasn't a formula. The answer wasn't, I'm going to do this. The answer was, I need to pursue the relationship with Jesus so that all that he said and all that he has done becomes the truth. It's, it was a difficult, a really difficult thing for me personally. My situation is unique to me. Everybody who comes up here and, and speaks into a microphone about this is going to tell you your situation will be unique. And there's a major reason for that. It's because Jesus loves you unique to how he loves anyone else because he knows you better than you know you and better than anyone else knows you. He knows your pluses, your minuses, your faults, your positives, your negatives. He knows the things you're great at. He knows the things that you're that you absolutely love to do in your private time, in your public time. He knows all of those things and he looks at the whole package and he loves you. And he desires to take away your sin and he desires to demonstrate that he loves you and that doesn't happen through any religious principles. It happens through relationship. I am trusting and I am praying that sometime in your life, whether it's while you're at Emmanuel or after you leave Emmanuel, sometime in your life that you will look square into the face of Jesus and have that conversation that you can only have with someone you're in a relationship with and tell him exactly how you want to live your life. And my prayer is that you ask him to live it for you, with you, and about you. Let's pray together.
Lord, I thank you so much that we get the opportunity to hang out and, and talk about you and do stuff. I thank you that there's not a person occupying a seat in this room, Lord, that, that you haven't at one time or another spoken to directly. I know, Lord, that every one of us has heard clearly that you love us and desire to have a relationship with us. And I know, Lord, that it comes from your word, crystal clear, that you love us. I pray that in the time that we're together, that we can experience the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we can experience the love that you have for us, and we can celebrate that in our relationships together. I pray that you would give us wisdom. I pray that you would give us sensitivity and love beyond our imagination. And I ask, Lord, that you would give us the opportunity just to demonstrate and share who you are in the relationships that we have together. I praise you for this day, and I thank you so much to uh, be able to share together. I also ask, Lord, that you would just continue to walk with us on this campus and protect us. In your precious name, amen. Seniors. <laughs>